Sorry, didn't see you come in. Uh, this is a whole different look than you guys are used to, isn't it? This is me hanging out in my man cave right now, but I wanted to give you a follow-up on how the AMD system was going because of the fact that as you guys have probably seen from my build video and then my follow-up, subsequent follow-up, that I had a motherboard go bad. So that sort of soured the initial experience. But now that I've had the uh, system in the you know house here for a while now and I've done some live streams with it and I've got to spend quite a few hours gaming on it, uh, all of my thumbnails and stuff that I made on the channel for the last little bit have been on this system. I thought it'd be time to actually go ahead and give you guys, you know, a little bit of feedback on that. But uh, speaking of feedback, I don't know. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. The new T30 high quality PC fan from Fantex features a three phase motor, dual Vapo maglev bearing, 30 millimeter thickness for improved airflow and static pressure and a six year warranty, making the T30 fan a single solution for all your cooling needs. To see the full list of features, click the sponsored link in the description below. Let's talk about the 7950X3D. Uh, and the fact that this video is edited by me on a weekend, just me hanging out in here, the lighting's gonna look weird, the sound is probably gonna be weird, although the sound in here is probably a lot better than our studio. But moving on, the 79X3D is a CPU that I said, obviously I was gonna base my next Actually, I take that back. Let's rewind here. I said I was gonna use the 7950X as my CPU because of how uh, impressed I was with the 7000 series AMD processors. The reason why I went with AMD is because of the fact that we knew that the 7950 or the, excuse me, the X3D CPUs were gonna be coming out. As snobbish as it may sound, the systems that I have at home, like you see the one behind me, which I guess we're kind of dubbing Nebula 2.0 now even though technically it's a lower spec than what Nebula was, which had SLI in it before SLI was completely dead with two 2080 Ti's. Um, it, was a, it was a nice system, but I had to downsize because the 928 case was just far too big. So this is a 925, Inwin 925. Anyway, if you haven't seen the build, go and check it out. You'll learn everything you need about those, this build in those couple of videos. I was running a 10900K system in here, which is not by any means a slow old system, but I was starting to have some OS degradation lots of weird crashes. Uh, you know, I had been voltage tuned and it was running like 5.1 gigahertz all core somewhere around there. It wasn't bad. The problem is it's actually started to fall behind in, term of, in terms of the IPC race um, and just its general overall snappiness. And I think it's because of how much progression we've seen since a 10900K came out with the 5000 series AMD processors and then obviously 11th gen, 12th gen and now 13th gen. But the biggest question I keep getting is, Jay, why the heck did you choose AMD over Intel? When I started this channel, I was running an 8120 FX processor. That was definitely nothing worth writing home for. It was one of those processors you kind of find yourself going, it's not a great processor, but it's a, uh, you know, it was a good value. As the Ryzen line of processors came out and just got better and better and better, it started to become an incentive for me to kind of take a chance with it because since the 8120 and then the 8350 that I swapped it out with, uh, later on, I ended up having 3770K, 4790K, Devil's Canyon, and then from there went into the X platform with X99 processors, a few variations there, and then X299. And then uh, I went back to mainstream after the X series sort of got dropped and just kind of forgotten about with Intel. Um, I ended up then going back to mainstream with the 10900K. I didn't have any other processors prior to that. I ended up having a 9980XE, ninth gen, before the 10th gen. And then that's where I left it. I actually downsized the amount of cores that I had. However, uh, it was one of those things where I wanted to go back to the, the fast IPC, the fast core clocks and the 9980XE just wasn't cutting it there. Not to mention it was a lot of heat, a lot of voltage, and it just was not doing it for me anymore. So as I kind of watched what AMD was doing and got to, got to play around with the 7950X processors, the 7900X processor, built a few systems with them, I just became like completely shocked at how snappy they were. Now I wasn't entirely sure if that was attributed just the fact that there was DDR5. I wanted to basically, after nearly 10 years of using exclusively Intel rigs at home, wanted to move on to an AMD rig and see over the last decade, with the complete change of management that took place at AMD multiple times, and now Lisa Sue has kind of been running things for a while now. She was interim CEO and is now full-time CEO because she proved her competency there in running the company. I want to know, were things any better? Typical systems I ran with AMD, all the way up to the 5000 series processors, always had this sort of an asterisk next to them. It was a great processor or great, you know, family of processors, but, and that but was usually, 
It does wonky stuff. Like for instance, first gen Ryzen 1800X. I ran an 1800X processor for a month. I did a whole video about using it for 30 days. I used it exclusively for all of my content creation at work, all my gaming at work, everything at work was done specifically with the 1800X. That particular whole fiasco started with a couple of bricked Asus boards, ironically, actually unironically, I guess, maybe foreshadowing. When it was up and running, it was great. Same thing with the uh, 2000 series processors. Would run great, but then you would get weird memory issues or memory compatibility issues. And a lot of those things I basically just attributed to the fact that they were early generations of a new family of processor. And it was gonna take time for both motherboard manufacturers to up the build quality of their motherboards. Cause here's the thing, you could have brands like Gigabyte, MSI, Asus, ASRock that built motherboards for both sides. They built Intel motherboards and AMD motherboards. For the FX motherboards, even though you would have like Maximus for Intel, which was like their top of the line and just you had your formulas and, and genes and all that sort of stuff, they were more robust, they were thicker PCBs, everything about them just, if weight was quality, then they were quality. But then you would have the Crosshair motherboard for AMD, which was, um, everything about it just felt cheaper. And I think that was because if you looked at market share, the bulk of the profit was going to come from Intel sales, not AMD. So why dump a ton of money into AMD board uh, building when you couldn't justifiably charge a lot for those motherboards? But anyway, as digressing now, as the build quality went up and the, the market share started shifting back towards center, uh, a lot of these brands really started working with AMD and saying, hey, uh, this, is a, this is a viable justified platform for us to now do some R&D and make it better. So over the last two weeks or so that I've been running this system. So as you guys have probably guessed by now, I cannot run AMD Expo 1 or AMD Expo 2 uh, with my particular 7950X3D sample. Now I have two samples. I could have switched it, but I didn't because this is the one that I received and I'm, it's just like, let's say this is the lottery. I went to Micro Center, I grabbed one, this is what I got. I'm not gonna just throw another one in and be like, it's great guys, because that wouldn't be a real like opinion review. Now this is an opinion review. I'm giving you my review from my use case. I'm not giving you, or, or how it's been for me. I'm not giving you a review that's saying, here's how it compares to other products. There's plenty of those out there now. My review would be well late to the, to the party on this one. That's why I'm giving you an opinion or an op-ed here about how it's been for me. So even before starting this video today, again, the other day I re-enabled Expo 2. Um, I did get an email from Asus during my motherboard issue video that I showed you guys that they gave me a lot of things to check, a lot of things to tweak and whatnot, and none of it matters. I, I, cannot, I cannot run Expo at all with this CPU. And this is the 6,000 megahertz RAM, which kind of stinks because 4,800 megahertz is obviously leaving a lot on the table. Now what I've done is I've manually moved it up to 5,200 all the loose timings that it comes with out of the box. Again, hasn't really seemed to have been a problem. DDR5 is such a huge upgrade over DDR4. I don't notice it in my particular workflows. However, if you do something RAM intensive, you're gonna notice it. But this gaming, or this CPU is intended for gaming. So the fact that it's a gaming CPU, that's sort of where I've spent a lot of my time with the exception of the fact that I will be editing this video on this CPU for the first time. So it's disappointing though, to know that I cannot run AMD Expo on this particular CPU. Now this still appears to be an X3D thing. And that's gonna be the case for 7900X3D, 7800X3D coming out. Uh, I think it just has something to do with this, the, the 3D vCache and fast memory. Um, another thing, this is a four dim motherboard running four sticks of any RAM with the X3D. It's not good, it doesn't boot, it doesn't work. Now that's something that should improve over time, but we've seen that with 7000 series uh, when it first launched prior to the X3D. And then over time, it got a little bit better as those uh, QBLs and BIOS uh, will increase the compatibility with RAM sets. The funny thing is that right now you can't even actually find a four DIMM RAM kit. So that's the other half of the problem is the fact that when you run four six of RAM, you put an extreme amount of stress on the memory controller because the capacity goes way up. So if I was to be running uh, two, two sets right now, I'd have 64 gigs of RAM. This is only a 32 gig kit, two times 16. Phil on the other hand in his 13th gen is running 128 gigabytes of, of memory because he chews through it with his edit timeline. And uh, he has to actually run the memory all the way down at 4,000 megahertz, which is 800 megahertz slower than base clock. 
So I guess technically 4,000 is the base clock, but 4,800 is like where it tries to go. It has to remove all of that because there's a lot of stress. I can't run four sticks at all, period on this, at least until we see some BIOS updates. When it comes to gaming, gaming has actually been pretty nice on this CPU. Let me give you an example. The monitor you see behind me right here is a 3860 by 1600. That's a 38 inch ultra wide LG. It is not a 3440 by 1440. 3860 is PC 4K wide with 1600 pixels vertical. So it is like in between a 16 by 10 panel and a 4K panel that's a 16 by nine, which just gives you this really odd resolution uh, or really odd um, aspect ratio. But it's a lot of pixels. It's like three quarters of the way to 4K. That's a lot of stress. It's way more than a 1440p. I had a 4090, the, the Founders Edition card, in my 10900K system that I was using for my live streams and stuff and realistically just trying to see if it would, if it would burn up on me until they figured out that it was just poorly plugged in cables. Uh, I never had an issue with it, but what I did see was all sorts of FPS spikes and FPS dips. And that's because of the fact that we know the 10900K would absolutely bottleneck a 4090. At this resolution, I wasn't expecting that, but that's what was happening. So I was live streaming World of Warships, which, you know, they up their uh, FPS cap of their engine from 75 up to 144 now, I think it is somewhere around there. But to see that even a game like World of Warships, you know, have major FPS dips and then see major CPU spikes was telling me that the 10900K was starting to age. So going with something new was definitely um, one of the reasons why I chose AMD. Again, could have gone 13900K. I was concerned about temperatures with 13900K. Speaking of temperatures, let's talk about this. I'm running two 360 millimeter by 30 millimeter radiators, uh, one on top, one on the front. This is not the most optimized airflow case. As you can see, the front is sealed and the top is sealed, so that air just gets splashed out the sides and a lot of that will get picked up by the rad and recirculated. So it runs a little bit warmer in terms of water temp than say if it was a different, more optimized fresh airflow case. Uh, but it's not throttling at all. It's getting pretty near its upper echelon of temperatures. For instance, if I run Cinebench R23, um, that's a very difficult test to run. With the curve optimizer at minus 30 on all of the cores, because I do a per core curve optimizer, minus 30, um, it scores a mid 37,000. Now that is where a 7950X scores with no overclock whatsoever. Once there's an overclock applied to a 7950X non-3D, it scores roughly 40,000. So this is about 2,500 points lower than that, but we know that. That's because only one CCD has the SAC VRAM, or uh, the VCache, and one CC does not, and the overall clock speeds are lower. But with the Curve Optimizer at a minus 30, I'm getting 5.2 gigahertz all core on one of the CCXs, and on the other CCX, I'm getting uh, 5,050. There's a trade-off there. If I were doing all my editing from home again, if I were by myself doing, okay, I'm gaming on the side, but the system is primarily for making videos, 7950X all day, non-3D. But when it comes to games, it is an absolute beast. Now, I'm running a 4090 Strix card in here. It's a water-cooled Strix, which is just because of the fact that I want to run a water-cooled card. I'm not even overclocking it. There's no point in overclocking a 4090 at all, even at this resolution. This resolution, 7860 by 1600, even with hard to, game, hard to run games like uh, Hogwarts Legacy, which is a, like a lot of people are calling it the new crisis because it's not the most optimized. I can lock the FPS at 120. There's a 144 hertz panel. Uh, I can lock it at 120. The reason why I locked it at 120 is because when I do my live streams, there's 60 FPS streams and it's a complete half rate. So that way, if I go like 144, I won't get those weird drop frames that rendered uh, in between, like there's a stream rendered frame in between two game rendered frames, which gets you the stutter. So I lock it at 120. 120 all day long, every day. All settings, like for Hogwarts Legacy, all settings set to ultra, ray tracing on, all ray tracing, and again set to ultra, locked at 120. So. Obviously a system like this should be no surprise that it's running a game like that at 120. Dead Space, the remake, which again has an optimized um, you know, graphics engine, which is not the hardest to run. Uh, I could run that at 200 plus FPS if I wanted. Again, I lock it at resolution or 120 if I'm streaming. Never hiccups, never moves, never changes whatsoever. So in terms of gaming so far, it has been great. As long as I'm not running AMD Expo. Now, the curb optimizer so far has been fine. It doesn't change the voltage or anything really, but I'll tell you right now, 
It's because of the, the V-cache being extremely temperature sensitive, it runs at a much lower voltage. So that's why the TDP is so much lower. You'll notice under load, it runs at about 145 to 155 watts. 160, I believe is the max. And even with the PBO or uh, any of the curb optimizer stuff set much higher than it would be at you know, stock, it doesn't really push the, the voltage any higher. It doesn't even push the wattage any higher. It runs, I, when I look over at my center panel, I'll see anywhere between 140, 142, and sometimes I'll see 155. I'm like, wow, uh, cool, it must be cool right now. Now here's the thing that's confusing about temperatures. We know that the new TJ Maxx is 89C, which is down from 95C on the non-3D. And again, that's because of the cache sensitivity to temperature. I cannot find any sensors, whether it be an ADA64, or any of the motherboard sensors, or hardware monitor, because I like, my sensor panel is an ADA64 sensor panel, so it talks to all the sensors the system sees. I cannot find the sensor that matches the one that Ryzen Master is showing. I'm starting to think that Ryzen Master might be an average because we know one CCX is gonna run hotter than the other. Either CCX or CCD, I can't remember. I keep calling it CCX, which I know it called it on Threadripper. Let's just go with that, okay? If it's a D, fine, whatever. I have to assume it might be an average because of the fact one is running higher than the other. The 3 dB cache clocks are lower and the other CCDX, CCX or CCD is higher. It has to be an average because any individual sensor that I see, there's CPU, there's CPU diode, and there's CPU package. But when I compare core temps, they're, they're often lower than what I'm seeing as any of the CPU temps reported. So what I've opted to do is have my sensor panel showing me a hotter, a hotter temperature than what Ryzen Master is. What I think it's showing me, because I'm using CPU package, I think it's showing me the hottest temperature reported in the package. That's what I think is happening. So I have no freaking idea what the temperatures are actually like on this one. But I can tell you it hits the low 80s. Now what's weird about that is when my sensor panel will show it's hitting 81, 82, 83, it'll show like 77, 78 in Ryzen Master. So again, I don't know. Uh, you would think with this giant Velocity 2 water block and two 360 millimeter radiators that I would be getting better than mid 80s. But the thing is, the architecture is designed to do it. So it's going to push itself as close to that ceiling as it can. So I can't be too upset about that. I've never seen it get anywhere near 89, which is where it will start to throttle. So I'm okay with that. Overall, it does feel ironically cooler in this room, even though I have a 4090 in there now, versus the 10900K, because of the fact that the 10900K was still running over 250 watts under load, this is running 100 watts lower than that. So that's less watts dissipated into the room, which means less heat. Now over time, it will still get pretty warm, but overall, it's a lot cooler in here than it's been. So what do I plan to do if this system starts giving me headaches? Well, I gotta, I gotta ride it for a while. I've gotta just go through a few BIOS updates. I've gotta wait for it to mature a little bit before I can make my long-term decision. My biggest fear actually is the Asus motherboard. There have been so many reports of Crosshair Hero and Crosshair Extreme motherboards just failing. Bad motherboard traces, apparently bad memory traces have been discovered, which is, kind of, uh, I think on the Extreme specifically, which I think is exactly what happened with my Asus Hero. Um, it's been frustrating. And considering the fact that the problems did not show themselves until a week later, has been very scared for, <laughs> am I gonna last a month, two months, six months? If it starts to become problematic, then what I will more than likely do is keep the 7950X 3D, but I'll probably switch to another brand like Gigabyte or heck, I, even the Tai Chi has been a great board, the Azrock Tai Chi. I love that motherboard for the 7950X because I could literally say uh, curb optimizer, minus 30, ADC maximum temp, tune and go. And it will do all the settings it needs to get you the max performance with those settings. And it's Sick. I kind of wish I'd use that motherboard. Realistically, I didn't because the color theme clashed because it's brass and black and it doesn't go with this build. It is shallow, why I chose not to use it, but again, for a themed build like this, the theme mattered. Again, far from a full review, just a little bit of an op-ed on how the last week has been. So far, I can recommend the 7950X 3D to a tinkerer. 
somebody that likes to tinker with their system. Because here's the reality, I still have a little bit of anxiety know, not knowing if I go to push that power button, if it's gonna post. It sucks, but that's part of, a, of adopting the bleeding edge. And it's also part of adopting bleeding edge so I can give you guys feedback and re report on my experience with using these particular CPUs. That way you guys know what may be you know in store for you if you decide to go with it. So far I'm happy. The memory hasn't had to retrain every time I turn it on, which is something that was happening before. I am using the Kingston uh, RAM in there right now, so not the Corsair stuff, but that's just because I like the colors and I have to run IQ. It could just tie in with the motherboard uh, armory crate, and I'm happy with that. So you guys need to tell me now, do you want me to give you another update, say 90 days from now, uh, short of anything happening in the meantime? Sound off down below if you guys would like me to do that. And as always, thanks for watching. And this video is not gonna edit itself, but I like to relax and play guitar, so. I suck. I'm also holding it really weird. All our systems are just dust in the wind anyway. Or the dust in the wind makes its way in your system, I'm not sure. Actually, all that dust is just skin, which is just really gross if you think about it. Thanks for watching.